it doesn't matter that GPT hallucinates, right? It doesn't matter that it gives you the wrong answers sometimes. It doesn't matter that it's not, you know, great at doing math, right? All of these things will come. I mean, believe me, right? It'll get better at all of these things. But the key obstacle, right? And I saw hundreds and hundreds of PhD dissertations in AI and natural language just sort of crash and burn, right? And go nowhere because they couldn't build a machine that could converse with you like a human does, right? And that's what essentially got the world's attention is for the first time, you could actually talk to a machine, right? And the way I view it is that it really took AI from being an application to being a general purpose technology, right? And by general purpose technology, I mean something like electricity or the internet. Thanks for joining us on our panel, Wait, but how do I invest using AI with Hari Krishnan and Vasant Dar? Before we get into today's conversation, I want to mention that back in 2020, you guys both joined us for a down the rabbit hole conversation on machine learning, AI, and investing. Three and a half years later, it seems like everything has changed dramatically and AI appears to be eating the world. So we're back again today with Harry and Vasant for an update. Why don't you guys reintroduce yourself to our viewers? Sure. Um, you know, I brought machine learning to Wall Street in 1994. I went to work at Morgan Stanley um, in one of the prop trading groups. Um, and that's how I got started, you know, initially looking at volatility overlays for some of the existing strategies. Uh, and then subsequent to that, just, you know, starting SCT and, you know, just, um, uh, you know, developing completely systematic machine learning based strategies. So, uh, yeah, since 94. So it's almost 30 years, believe it or not. Yeah, and we should also point out, of course, that you are a professor at Stern School of Business at the Center for Data Science, uh, where you teach on lecture on these topics. I do. I teach a course on systematic investing um, that I've been teaching for you know, well, almost 15 years now. Um, really fun to teach. And I basically, you know, people call me a pracademic. <laughs> And so I, I, I take sort of my real world experiences and bring them to the classroom. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, indeed it is. Harry, you of course are no stranger to a Real Vision audience either. You've been on with uh, us many times. We've had a lot of conversations. Uh, you and I, of course, we should probably mention parenthetically, co-wrote a book together called Market Trenomers, Quantifying Structural Risks in Modern Financial Markets. Uh, you've been on many times. Talk a little bit about your journey, both uh, in the academic sense uh, as well as the professional sense to get to where we are right now and how you're currently using and thinking about AI? Well, um, I started as a tourist, frankly. Uh, when I was a grad student, I read a few papers. One was by Leo Bryman on, um, I think it was on bagging and random forests and a lot of machine learning techniques that hadn't been really applied at the time. I also read David Mumford's book, uh, essay, long essay. I think it was called the dawning of the age of stochasticity, which made a bold claim at the time, which was that, uh, you know, the old school Aristotelian logic would be replaced by giant statistical inference engines as models for the brain and the way the brain thinks. And that was pretty profound for me, but I never did anything with it until I joined the Santa. And now I'm uh, an accidental participant in the space. So I'm, I'm delighted to be on. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing right now. Bring a little bit of context to this conversation. Uh, Vasant, talk about what you guys are doing today using AI. Well, um, so before I do that, let me just provide a little bit of context, right? Because it's been a long journey and I think it's important to appreciate why we're doing what we're doing today. Right? So as you might imagine, I started off using machine learning in the way most people would use it, right? You take a bunch of data, you create features, you run algorithms on that, you come up with patterns, uh, you, you backtest them, you make sure you do things carefully, scientifically, avoid overfitting, all of that good stuff, right? That's sort of standard machine learning stuff. So that's how I got started. Um, and over the years, you know, as is sometimes the case, you sort of learn by doing, right? So, um, and over the years, I realized that, um, if I took that approach, the machine often gave me patterns that I didn't want. Uh, and essentially what, what I mean by that is that it was giving me beta instead of alpha because beta was more stable. Uh, I wanted 
to use machine learning to extra, machine learning to extract alpha, but most of the time it was giving me beta. Why is that? The reason that happens, and this emerged sort of 20 years later, and I feel like a, 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 a you know a, a bit of a uh, I don't know, you know, pick your favorite <laughs> expression. I feel a little slow that it took me so long to realize this, but you know, my my sort of core realization was that uh, finance is very different from perception, where you know, AI and machine learning have had huge success. And that's because it's highly noisy. There's very little signal in the problem. And what I found was, you know, over, you know, based on a bunch of simulations, was that as a problem gets noisier, a standard machine learning algorithm will amplify the bias in the data, sort of in proportion to the noise, right? So if you think about it, if a problem is completely predictable, completely de deterministic, your prediction distribution will mirror the actual. Whereas if it's completely random, there's absolutely no signal in the data, then the prediction distribution shrinks to a point, namely the average, right? And uh, so that's what I realized. And since finance falls closer to the sort of random end of the spectrum, that was my frustration with sort of standard machine learning algorithms. So I've spent the last, I don't know, seven, eight years sort of rectifying that and getting the machine to actually give me models that have good properties as opposed to emergent behavior that I don't want. And by good properties, I mean, you know, better convexity, right? Because that's what a hedge fund is supposed to be. Less beta and 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 sort of more quote unquote alpha. Um, and so that's where I've ended up. And so these models now that we're building have much better convexity properties, um, but of course they can still be wrong. And so that's where Hari comes into the picture for sort of a more explicit engineered solution to the problem where you know your your machine learning model may not work. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make one comment to, to break it down a bit. Um, one thing that uh, Vasant focus, focuses on a lot is the notion that um, if you give, if you train a machine on slightly different data, it shouldn't make wildly different decisions. And so model stability is a major factor. And, if you think of something like the S&P 500, which has been trending up most of the time for many, many years, let's say since the 1940s or whenever, uh, if you want to create the most stable model to trade long and short in the S&P, you just buy and hold. Because no matter what data you show to the machine, it's going to make the same decision, just buy and hold. And so that's the most stable model. And so you run into a lot of issues that you wouldn't if you don't think about the problem deeply, which are that you cannot optimize over stability, but you must take it into account. You want your machine to be repetitive in the way that it looks at things without overemphasis on a particular data set that it's trained on. And let me ask you a question. How do you deal with that? Because if model stability is the only objective, uh, and if uh, you know that's true, then you know, basically what you get is beta and we all just take a nap and don't do anything, right? So how do you try and derive alpha uh, from a model that the longer term data stability objective states would be essentially buy and hold? Well, Vasanth will add to this, but um, model stability isn't the only thing you optimize over. Right. You also want accuracy and you want to come up with lots of predictions because if your accuracy is 52%, let's say, you need to make lots of bets to lock in that statistical edge, but I'll hand it over. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, you know, thanks for pointing that out, uh, Hari. The, you know, I think what Hari was referring to earlier about stability is what I call model variance, right? So if you make small perturbations to the training set, how much does your decision making change? And I, right. and and the important thing is decision making, not performance, right? Because if your decision making changes a lot, then you shouldn't trust the model, right? So your your decision making should be relatively stable, um, and. So this gets me to sort of, you know, what have we been doing, right? So the whole sort of emphasis now that we have is to actually constrain the machine, to guide it, to look for uh, patterns in a way that sort of give you these convexity properties, right? So essentially, so, so okay, let me sort of step back a, a second, right? So if you look at standard things like trend following models, right? 
the thing that is sort of wicked about them is that they have a very unpredictable holding period distribution, right? You may hold for three days, 300 days, 200 days, sort of depending on the, the, the speed of your model. You just don't know, you know how long you're going to hold. What we're really shooting for is models that have like a, a, a sort of a predictable distribution, right? And that's what I call a constraint. Um, and so the way we sort of approach the problem now is we want the model to be unbiased, right? So we, we don't want to be just long, but we also want it to be stable, right? And so the way we approach it is sort of through this two-step process where we say, all right, let's just first work on coming up with a model that has the right kind of behavior that we want, because right. we know that we, we don't want trend following behavior, right? We want a behavior, and by behavior, I mean, you know, a certain holding period distribution. We then figure out sort of, you know, what sort of complexity we need, and this reminds me of Einstein's sort of maxim, which is that a model should be as, you know, complex as possible, but no more, right? And so simple that's what possible, we basically, yes. as, as simple as possible, yes. <laughs> you know, but no simpler. Yeah. <laughs> yes, mangle that one up. <laughs> um, so that was really, it's, so it's so good advice what, if you're working at a bank, Vasan. <laughs> <laughs> touche. 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 Yes. touche. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that's the idea, right? Is that we we need we need some complexity for in order to get alpha, right? You're not going to get alpha without complexity. So you need sort of some level of complexity. And so that's what we do to get the right kind of behavior. And then the next sort of problem is to, you know, rank these models according to some sort of criterion. Mm -hmm. um, and then pick an ensemble at, at sort of the last step to minimize variance, right? Which is what sort of ensembles are supposed to be about, right? So that's sort of, it's sort of a three-stage process. First, get the behavior that you want. Second, rank them. And third, pick an ensemble to reduce variance, right? So the net result is you want something that's unbiased, but still stable, right? So that's the holy right. grail. And that's kind of what we've been working on. And the results so far are, are really interesting and intriguing, right? We, we get sort of behavior that, you know, where our sample performance looks like quite similar to in sample, which is um, something to celebrate. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's our suspicion and Vasant would know more about this than I do, but. It, our suspicion that um, machine learning methods will probably lead to long carry, short left tail risk strategies, because those are the sorts of signals that emerge from the sea of data. And so avoiding right. that, where you're just loading on the same risk that everyone already has, uh, is vital. And so right. making the making or constraining the systems in a soft way so that they're more dynamic, that they trade both sides, long and short, um, and they don't stick in a position too long, we think could is very accretive. You know, guys, in order to make this much more concrete and to bring it down to earth, without giving away the secret sauce, can you give us a, a simplified, stylized example uh, of how you would actually implement this with regard to a specific model, uh, just so we can get a sense of how the actual implementation of the strategy works? I, I actually thought I just I gave away the secret sauce, but but let me actually provide <laughs> some more detail behind the sauce because I'm not concerned at all about giving it away the secret sauce because it takes a while to recreate it. So secret sauce specifically, right? I'll give you the details. Is uh, you know we basically have a method, right? We have a bunch of complexity parameters, right? We start with like really simple parameters, and we say, does that give us the does that give us this holding period distribution that we want? And the answer is no, it doesn't. So you introduce a little bit of complexity, ask the same question again, iterate until you get the right behavior that you want from the complexity that you have infused into the model, right? So that's sort of the first step is make the uh, machine generate models that have the right behavior. And that's by sort of gradually increasing complexity, right? The Einsteinian notion. Right, that'll give you thousands or tens of thousands of possible models. Right, if you apply that method, you can you can get a, a plethora of models. The problem is that most of them won't perform. Right, most of them will perform relatively poorly. So then the question you have to ask yourself is: Under what conditions is it important for you to perform well? 
right? And that's sort of the standard notion of like, what's the validation set in machine learning, right? So if it's important for you to perform well when the VIX is high, well, that's what you'd pick as your validation set, right? To sort of do model selection. And at the last stage, you put the ensemble together, right? So there's the secret sauce nicely and, tied up. And the simple, the simple minded version, which uh, I can give you is that uh, you can constrain a model to say that in such a way that you say, this model can never be long more than five days in a row. It's got a switch. And so the more days it's long in a row, the more pressure the constraint is applying to force it to go the other way. And most markets have rhythms. They tend to have winning or up streaks and down streaks, and there's a distribution you can build. Um, and to create models which are dynamic enough to move around uh, without reference to the prevailing trend is very significant because that's what people want. You know, in the short term contrarian future space, uh, there has been a lot of interest, at least in principle, because these strategies can be long volatility. They can be long realized vol, whereas longer term trend following systems tend to be less so. But to build such a system in the right way is a real challenge because it's well known that short term trends are hard to pick. A lot of them reverse. So it's very important to do things in a slightly more sophisticated way. Short term trends are only hard to pick if you want to get it right. No, well, you can <laughs> pick them. Yeah, you can definitely pick them. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you guys this, a foundational question. Uh, we've used the terms AI and machine learning here kind of uh, almost interchangeably. Uh, talk to us about the definition there uh, and how you guys understand the decision, the, the, the uh, distinction between the two. And we should probably also throw in deep learning as well. So AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Yeah, so, you know, I view um, machine learning as being a subset of artificial intelligence, right, which is more broadly about uh, you know, understanding intelligence in general, right? So that, so you know, that so that's the goal of artificial intelligence is to understand intelligence, whether it's human, animal, right? So that's the sort of larger goal of AI. Machine learning is a subset of that in that uh, we focus on learning from data, right? Whereas in AI, you can learn from anywhere. You can actually extract knowledge from humans and represent it as we used to do in the expert systems paradigm, right? That was also AI. In deep learning. Okay, so one more thing. So in machine learning, what we do is we take raw data and typically you featureize it, right? You build features from the data and then you learn based on those features, right? So if you have medical data, you may say, you know, how often has the person had X in the past, right? That's a feature that you actually construct from, uh, you know, sort of transactional data. Same thing in finance. With deep learning, essentially what you do is you try and eliminate the whole feature construction process, right? You take the data as is. You take an image as is, you take numbers as is, you take text as is, and you let the machine do that feature construction for you, right? So instead of having to engineer the features, the machine essentially does the feature construction for you on its own, right? So it's like directly raw input data to prediction, and the machine does everything, including feature engineering, uh, and then, you know, learning the weights of the network to basically minimize overall prediction error, right? So that's how I view AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Yeah, there, there's an interesting um, side comment here, which is that uh, if you're looking at images, which are sort of big matrices or arrays, um, it doesn't really on pixel, it might be. So outliers can be kind of smoothed away. They're not significant. In the financial markets, outliers are very significant. This is kind of the Nassim Taleb world. And so that's one of the reasons that um, we partnered because as someone who focuses on volatility for managing uncertainty in portfolios, it's a good, uh, it works well in conjunction with something that aggregates, a system that aggregates large amounts of data, uh, doesn't focus too much on the extremes and tries to find or identify finer patterns in the data. So I think that's a, an interesting aside relative to image uh, image processing. And just to sort of add to that, right, I, I think the way to sort of think about the progression of AI is in terms of sort of these paradigm shifts, right? We started off, you know, when I got into AI, it was all about specifying knowledge by extracting it from the human brain, right? Figure out how, how people do things and then represent it 
and the machine would then follow those instructions, the rules that you specified, right? That sort of stalled at some point because it was too complex, right? Intelligence is too complex to be specified in terms of rules, right? It's just heterogeneous, it's subtle, right? Um, and so the next sort of progression was, well, let's let's get the machine to actually learn automatically from data, but we still had to do feature engineering. Um, and then that ran into bottlenecks because how do we know we're engineering the right features, right? If a medical diagnostic system is looking at an image, let's say of a lung, you know, the human in the old days had to describe the image. Oh, there's a dark spot on the right side, you know, on the right periphery of the lung. That's, you lose information. Now you just feed the image and the machine figures out the, you know, features from the image itself, right? So that's the sort of right. progression that we've seen in, in AI, you know, through these paradigm shifts. I'd really like to uh, just take a moment to pause here and open up this conversation to our viewers. If you have questions for Harry and Vasant, please drop them into the chat. I'd love to ask uh, those questions from our viewers and listeners to this conversation. Uh, and by the way, if you're watching this live here, uh, it's about uh, 2.20 Eastern time. The Fed has held constant on rates, still 500 to 525 basis points. So now you have no excuse to s switch away. You can keep watching this show <laughs> and this great conversation uh, that we're having here right now. Uh, let me ask you this, and this is a question that uh, we've been thinking about here at Real Vision, and, and the question is this. So if AI can give an edge to certain investors, uh, does that mean it will immediately be arbitraged away uh, due to the egalitarian nature of AI, AI or even regulated away? Uh, if so, in a world of AI, uh, do we need a new edge? Does it basically uh, level the playing field or not? Yeah, great question. So... Let me, let me start with the second question first about the regulation, because I've been the victim of that, right? Um, so I traded a, you know, a high frequency strategy for, uh, you know, quite a few years in the early part of this century. Uh, and it worked like a charm, like double digit sharp ratios. Um, and then overnight, the edge disappeared, right? And that's mm -hmm. because of reg NMS, right? So Reg NMS came and just kind of wiped out the edge from that strategy pretty much overnight, right? So this is the national best bid, best offer uh, regulation that you're referring to here. Exactly, exactly. Like basically making you know the entire market a fast market, right? Um, so that totally wiped the edge, and and so high frequency strategies are particularly susceptible to sort of these changes in market structure that might happen, or changes in the microstructure that might actually happen because of regulation. Um, and I, so I've, seen, I've, I've witnessed, witnessed that firsthand. About your other question about whether the edge will get arbed away, that really depends, right? There's two ways of looking at that. One is that there's a finite set of opportunities in the market, right? Ford versus GM, pairs trading, et cetera, right? So if you look at the world that way, yes, you know, uh, alpha gets discovered, other people discover it, you know, word gets around, people move around and it disappears. But there's another way to look at the market, which is, you know, that patterns emerge before reasons for them become apparent, right? That the market is not stationary, it's not static. So as opportunities are being, uh, you know, arbed away or discovered, new patterns are, arrive are arising because of new instruments, new behaviors, you know, and all that kind of stuff uh, that, that are coming into the picture. So this is not a static kind of game. It's, it's like being on a treadmill, right? You have to be constantly vigilant for new sources of alpha, right? And machine learning is great for that. I've always argued that machine learning is great as a theory building tool because it can help you uncover patterns faster than other people. But the other side of it is that you have to be vigilant about alpha really eroding as well. And that's not an easy problem, especially with you know, strategies with sharp ratios of one uh, or, you know, or in that neighborhood. It isn't obvious that alpha has eroded right away, like it is with a high frequency strategy that has a sharp ratio of 10. Harry, I saw you nodding. Jump in. Well, I agreed with everything. There's very little for me to add uh, uh, on that point. So I'll, I'll sit back. Let me ask you this. Uh, as, as people who are watching this space, uh, for all of the obvious reasons, I'm curious what you think, you know, sort of more generally and colloquially you see happening. Obviously, AI was, it's interesting, I was having this conversation with someone the other day where I said, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, AI uh, was whispered to be just around the corner and then it was gonna be six months later and then another six months, another six months. And we went through this period where AI was always the technology of the future. It never seemed to happen. 
Uh, and then one morning we just woke up and everybody in the world, it seems simultaneously, uh, who was an early adopter was obsessed with chat GPT. What do you think is the sort of the, your general interpretation uh, about the sort of mass market adoption of AI? How do you guys see it? How do you guys think about it? Or not at all? Or are you just too focused doing what you're doing to really have a whole lot of bandwidth to allocate to those kinds of thoughts? Oh, no, I've, I've got plenty of bandwidth to allocate to that. In fact, I've used these models. I've, I've used pre-trained models to actually build uh, systems that predict, you know, various things based on uh, uh, text and, and images. But I think what really got people's attention is the fact that for the first time, you could actually talk to a machine, right? And it could it could converse with you, right? To me, that was like a, a complete game changer. It doesn't matter that GPT hallucinates, right? It doesn't matter that it gives you the wrong answers sometimes. It doesn't matter that it's not, you know, great at doing math, right? All of these things will come. I mean, believe me, right? It'll get better at all of these things. But the key obstacle, right? And I saw hundreds and hundreds of PhD dissertations in AI and natural language just sort of crash and burn, right? And go nowhere because they couldn't build a machine that could converse with you like a human does, right? And that's what essentially got the world's attention is for the first time, you could actually talk to a machine, right? And the way I view it is that it really took AI from being an application to being a general purpose technology, right? And by general purpose technology, I mean something like electricity or the internet, right? Um, right. And yeah, and, and sort of just to sort of build on that, yeah, I was giving a talk a few weeks ago, well, more, more like a month ago at a, at a major bank here locally, and I asked the executives, this is a bunch of executives, and I said, do you think AI will have an impact that could actually rival or exceed that of the internet and electricity? I said, am I being absurd? And the answer was, no, you're not being absurd. It, it actually could. Right? And this is not me talking. This is a bunch of 50 you know, senior bank executives saying, Wow, yeah, I think it could. So, so this is something big, and we're really in the in the very, very early innings of it, right? But I think what's sort of unleashed the power of AI is the fact that you can actually talk to the machine and it seems to understand you. And and that's going to have all kinds of sort of ancillary benefits, such as giving it all kinds of training data that it hasn't ha you know, that it hasn't had access to in the past, right? Just imagine the sort of volume and quality of training data that becomes available when the machine is able to quote unquote understand what you're telling it. You know, yep. it just sort of changes the sort of fluidity of the conversation between humans and machines. Yeah, that's very well said. How about you, Harry? Any general thoughts uh, on mm -hmm. AI outside of the specific domain that you guys are using it uh, at SCT Capital? Well, I, I'm fairly domain specific, but I think this whole idea that uh, was raised about markets being an evolutionary system where there is feedback between the systems that seem to be working and the strategies that seem to be working and their future profitability uh, is actually something that should give people who wish to continue investing for the next for the indefinite future some hope and belief that they can still come up with things because the system inherently has the sort of feedback that will lead to changes over time. And as people know, as the audience knows, leverage tends to wind up and unwind very rapidly. Yeah. And those regime shifts are hard for machines to pick up. Breakpoints, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but identifying sharp breaks in, in um, the structure of a system over time is something that machines struggle with. While we're talking about some of the sort of more uh, general audience questions about AI, we've been reading, uh, I think, in uh, mainstream media now for the last uh, several months about some of the sky is falling doomsday scenarios around AI. Uh, you guys work with AI. Do you share any of those potential concerns? Um, I do. Uh, you know, I, I didn't sign that sort of open letter calling for a moratorium on, on AI development and, you know, chat GPT and, and all of that, because I think that's a little late. You know, that train has left the station. But I see some sort of wicked uses of AI ahead that we really need to sort of prepare for, right? Because for the first time, we've got a situation where, 
you know, you've, you've got a machine that's capable of creating things where you can't tell, you know, fiction from reality, you know, and all these kinds of things. So, you know, th there are great risks that it imposes. And I think Jeff Hinton put it really well, right? He said, it's, it's as if an alien civilization has arrived on Earth, but we're having a hard time taking it in because they speak such good English, right? And I thought, you know, he couldn't have put it better than that. It's just like, you know, yeah, you know, it, it speaks good English, so that's great. But I think what we need to appreciate is that it speaks great English and it's an incredibly powerful tool and there will be sort of incentives for misuse. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I was having this conversation on my podcast uh, with my last guest uh, about, you know, uh, people in the future being born into a situation where there's an alien intelligence that already exists that's, you know, smarter than we are, right? Just try and get your head around that. That's a kind of uncanny and eerie way of thinking about it. But it's but that's the way it's going, right? I mean, it's it, it's just a matter of time before the intelligence of these machines exceeds ours in many respects, right? And so you come into this world and there's already a civilization far smarter than you are, right? That's that's unprecedented. Harry, any thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I worry about the slightly more mundane uh, notion that um, the fact that we live in an information age and the quality of information is so variable and the sources are so variable and unknowable in some cases. And if you combine that with the network effects or the herd mentality of people latching onto the same piece of information or the same image and putting the image out into the world and that level of reinforcement in packets of information that are picked up by the broader public, that can be very dangerous because the information could be bad or manipulative right. or simply wrong. And I do fear, I do fear for this quite a bit. Yeah, I guess one potential, potential solution to that problem, maybe this is just a shameless plug for what we do at Real Vision Crypto, uh, is the idea of blockchains having a role in becoming a, a kind of moderator function uh, of a source of truth so you can actually trace back the sourcing creation date and time. This is what blockchains are very good at doing. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's, uh, you know, whether that turns out to be the solution or not, that's certainly a step in the right direction because I think, uh, you know, you can't uh, hold a tool maker responsible uh, for harms, but I think you can focus on data and in authenticity as as the basis for harm so i, I think as an approach that's sort of the, with the focus on data that makes more sense than trying to regulate algorithms right so i, I think there's the, the focus on data makes a lot more sense yeah uh i should also point out i did a conversation during this festival of learning with alvin Fu, uh, where we talk about exactly the potential solution we just discussed there, which is the blockchain component for how AI and blockchain can potentially work together. Uh, or I suppose maybe a better way of saying it would be how blockchains can potentially solve this problem created by AI and this search for a source of truth. Uh, guys, I'm going to open this up to viewer questions in just one second. Uh, we've got some coming in already. Please, if you're listening to this conversation, just drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I'd be great to get them to Harry and Vassant. But I wanted to ask you this one final question as we close this topic out, uh, which is about the uses of AI uh, and how you guys are thinking about potentially investing in AI rather than using AI as a tool for investment. Do you guys have uh, any thoughts uh, on the potential investment opportunities in AI itself as a technology? Uh, you know, I, I, I think the opportunities are significant, right? Because a lot of the new startups will be, you know, somehow AI based. Um, but, you know, to be a little more mundane about this, I guess, you know, I, 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 I started going long on AI, you know, in 2017, 2018. You know, I, you know, I mentioned that I teach a course on systematic investing uh, at Stern. But one of the things we also talk about is the role of humans and what humans do well. And, you know, I remember like in 2015, 2016, you know, telling my class that, 
you know, I, you know I, I'd be going sort of really uh, long on, on tech and AI, and I sort of put my money where my mouth is. You know, my, I have my systematic part, but on the discretionary side, I just decided it was going to be, you know, NVIDIA, Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, as sort of the, the big AI platform players, right? But that's a play that's sort of largely played out at this point. Um, you know, I, I still think it has ways to go, but the important question is, you know, how do I identify the next wave of AI companies, right? And that's, in my mind, really exciting and interesting. Well, you did very well in that trade, if that was your advice back in 2016. <laughs> I, I did very well for a while. Uh, it was painful for a while, you know, during the correction, you know, I mean, yep. You know, companies like NVIDIA went to a third of their price. Uh, so I sort of started doubling down on them, um, you know, not necessarily at the right prices, um, you know, because I just felt that these companies were going to be dominant. You know, I think companies like NVIDIA with the digital twin technology, you know, I think they're going to, you know, my, my, my guess is that they'll be pretty dominant in the, you know, in the uh, uh, autonomous vehicle space. So, you know, I think there's a huge potential for AI uh, in transportation, navigation, stuff like that. And so that's why I feel like these big uh, platform players still have a ways to go. But obviously there's much more upside among sort of smaller players, but I'm not sure what those are as yet. Harry, anything to add to that? Nope, that sounds, yeah, I'm in total agreement. I would say though that, um, I do have something to add, but I would say that a, a lot of the recent moves perhaps in these mega platform names are not a function of um, the underlying company dynamics as much as market dynamics. So, mm. you know, I, I wouldn't oversell the strength of, of performance purely on that basis, but also on the basis of, um, you know, the way participants in markets behave and the way flows behave and the relative dollar amounts that go into these names whenever people go into the market. Well, let's so. talk a little bit about that. You're talking about, in fact, the uh, the market, if uh, microstructure or market structure impacts on large names, you're talking about the, the breadth of these recent rallies that we've seen being relatively narrow, concentrated in some mm -hmm. of the very large tech platforms. What are you seeing from that perspective? Well, I'd, 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 I would just explain the mechanics, which are that um, many benchmarks are not fully replicated. So the biggest names are the most important. And if the benchmarks are cap weighted, then the dollars flow into the largest cap weighted names. And it's also fairly well known that if a company is 10 times as big as another company and it receives 10 times the dollars in investment in its shares, the price will move more than the smaller company simply because price impact doesn't just scale as a function of size. It, it's bigger than that. It's so, nonlinear. Um, it's nonlinear, that's the phrase. And so a lot of these things have probably driven these names up. Um, the, the fact that there's huge, dis huge dispersion has other, other factors driving it, but um, uh, those are not AI related. So I'll, I'll sit back. I mean, the hardest part is to know when to get out, isn't it? <laughs> You know, yeah. um, you know, I I, uh, I I was actually just communicating with my colleague Aswat Damodar, and you know, we talked about Nvidia in my conversation with him on our podcast. And uh, I noticed yesterday or, or recently that he dumped half his position. You know, but but at the same time, Aswat, you know, was was pretty clear that his style of investing means that he's going to sort of exit these positions prematurely. Right? That that is on a value basis, he tends to sort of, you know, cut his right tails off, but that's the nature of value investing. Right, so he's happy to leave some of that on the table uh, yeah, because exactly. his model uh, is based mm -hmm. on fundamental valuations. Uh, but the one question. other thing I would say very quickly is that, um, you know, the whole world of real assets, of commodities, that becomes actually increasingly important in a world where more and more power and money is concentrated in a, a small number of platforms because these things are still needed. They're still essential inputs into human existence. Yes. And so I, I could easily see a, a future where real assets have a life of their own, given demographics and so on, and political changes. And then there is, barring uh, anti-monopolistic regulation, 
there is kind of a consolidation in the rest of the rest of the um, equity markets. So um, it will be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, I was joking about this yesterday on a show, Harry, and I mentioned that Google has yet to figure out ways uh, to write code to create WTI meat. <laughs> exactly. Orange juice. Yeah. I mean, there are other things. <laughs> yeah. which, sometimes when you look at the growth of those large cap tech, excuse me, large tech large market cap tech platforms, uh, sometimes it appears uh, as though that fact has gotten lost. Indeed. Yep. All right, I'd like to go to our first question from our audience. This one comes to us from Sunil Mehta. And the question is, how do strategies based on real world data, for example, commodities and weather, compare to just pure market and technical models? Is there any real signal to find in the latter? That's a great question. I'll take a stab at it and then pass it over. Um, the good thing about price and perhaps price and volume based models is that it's a self-contained world. If you start delving into things like um, images at ports to see how many ships are going into the major ports in Singapore and so on, if you start looking at a variety of non-standard data, that's just one example, you don't know if you've captured the right stuff and if you missed something big out. Whereas if you restrict yourself intentionally to things that actually move, have real prices, real markets that define them, while you're obviously missing a huge amount, you're able to really drill down into a self-contained system or a self-contained um, set of data. And so I think that's the big advantage in continuing to, to take those approaches. How to add the other stuff is big question. Mix it all into one giant soup terrain, or do you have different models that do different things? That I will hand over uh, to uh, Vasan. Yeah, no, I, the only thing I want to add to that is that, um, you know, it really depends on sort of the frequency of the data as well, right? And the phenomenon that you're, that you're trying to model, right? I mean, if you're, if you're observing something once a week, you know, it just becomes hard to get sufficient amount of data for that. If you're observing something really frequently, uh, I mean, if you're observing the weather every hour, I don't know, probably doesn't matter. So the the trick really is to um, have the data at the right level, at the right frequency, so that you have enough of it. And as Hari says, it it should be you know something that's of standardized quality, right? And the thing about market data is that it's sort of it's it's pretty well commoditized. When you start getting into us these non-standard sources of data. I really worry about data quality and consistency. Let me ask you guys this question. You've both been doing this for a very long time, been watching markets for a very long time. What do you think the future looks like? Are we going to see more of these programmatic strategies developed based on AI? And what will potentially the market impact be of that? I think the short answer is yes, we'll see more of these strategies only because the tool set has expanded from sort of standard traditional sort of econometric models to, you know, this new breed of models that are much better at modeling certain kinds of data and phenomena, right? So, yeah, we're going to see more of this. Um, and uh, these are going to be necessary, but not sufficient going forward, right? So they, they sort of up the, 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 the playing field for everyone. But, they, you know, but the fundamental challenges still remain, right? This is a very noisy, low signal domain, and that's not going away. It's not suddenly going to become a high signal domain, right? It's always going to be low signal. It's one of the most competitive. That's not going to change. Yeah, I see systems performing to some extent a clerical function in the same way that um large legal documents can be poured through by a machine more effectively and quickly than yeah. perhaps by a, a junior lawyer. Um, the same may be true here where you take, you aggregate data and you try and denoise it or filter it and then use it perhaps even on a discretionary basis in investment. Um, so I could see a lot of that, that's already happening clearly. Even things like GDP now, now costing, our attempts to compress a large amount of data that comes in at different times and is of different, perhaps of different importance, into a small set of numbers. Mm. Those sorts of things are very useful exercises to do, but they don't replace the investment decision. 
The, the other thing I should add is that I think we'll see more proxies, uh, you know, emerge for, uh, let's say, market performance. And by proxies, I mean, you know, you may want to sort of estimate whether the economic activity in a certain area is increasing or decreasing, right? And that may be a proxy for sort of, you know, all kinds of other things in that area, such as whether a company will do well or not, right? So it's become possible uh, to get more and more of these sort of indirect proxies for the kinds of outcomes that you're interested in. Uh, and, and, you know, that's sort of becoming possible because of increased amounts of data and better tools for analyzing the data. Yeah, and, and, and as more people adopt these sorts of things, the models may, in fact, work better for a while. So, for example, let's say that the billion prices pro pro project gives you a better spot inflation number than you can get elsewhere. But nobody cares about it. Nobody uses it. Nobody looks at it. It's unlikely to have a big impact on prices, even if it's conceptually more accurate. Whereas if some people start to use it, then it, for a time at least, it becomes more effective. And that's kind of the complex systems view of how strategies work. If you have the best strategy in the world, but no one else agrees with your inputs, by best, I mean the most accurate way to forecast some real economic numbers. It might not work. Um, so it's being in that kind of upswing phase that's significant as well. Yeah, there's just so many areas you guys touched on the potential labor market impact. That's probably outside the scope of this conversation. Uh, but yes. Harry, you made uh, a very interesting point uh, and about professional services really potentially taking a hit. That's going to change uh, the dynamics potentially of the economy as well in a very significant way. Yeah, it hurts to think about it, to be honest, because a lot of people have dedicated their a good chunk of their lives to this sort of stuff. But yeah, what can I say? Yeah. I was having a conversation with uh, someone yesterday about AI and its role in potentially uh, replacing or displacing people who are in their careers now. And they said, oh, you know, the field of medicine is something, something you have to be hands on. You've got to, you know, physically be in the room with the patient. Nursing, for example, may experience an uptick in this. Uh, environment. And I said, but by gosh, I wouldn't want to be a 23-year-old radiologist. The point that you made earlier, Vasan, about machine learning, being able to go through scans uh, independently. I mean, how much longer uh, are we going to need the number of radiologists we do today? I mean, you think about the ability to just generate programmatic uh, output from programmatic input, and it's just a straight-through processing type of scenario. Absolutely. I would make one caveat, which is that Machines might re very rarely make, say, trading errors. Right. But humans rarely trade 100 times as many contracts as they should. So they're really glaring stuff. Often their yeah. human input can be important. It's a bit like flying a plane, I suppose. I don't know. Where um, the average accuracy will be far higher and the speed will be far greater, but it may still need a human uh, reality check from time yeah. to time. That's such a great metaphor, this idea of uh, low probability but high out impact uh, situations that could go terribly wrong uh, in the case well, of autonomous AI. driving is exactly that problem too. Yeah, it's it's really uh, cold comfort to know that on average, uh, you know, the model is safer uh, than a human driver if you happen to be the person who gets horrifically injured in a car accident. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but even so, even if that's the case, you probably wind up having, you know, one human being babysitting uh, machines that were doing the work for maybe 10. Yes, yes. Guys, okay, so, so much uh, to talk about here, so much potential to discuss, uh, but I wanted to get final thoughts and key takeaways from each of you. Uh, we started with Vasant at the top of the show. Harry, final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our listeners and our viewers with? Yeah, I'm going to co-opted for my colleague over there a bit, but uh, finance is a world of a lot of noise and not a very strong signal a lot of the time. Um, and so it's a, and it's a very dynamic, complex system where as new players enter with different models, the system changes a bit. So there's feedback. And so I think finance will always be a fruitful area for uh, humans to be involved in the development of new ideas and new approaches. It is kind of a more advanced frontier than many of the problems that have been cracked. And while a lot of the hype is certainly true for AI and machine learning and so on, 
uh, we still have to do our day-to-day -day jobs, which is to try and improve model performance in the real world. And that will not go away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I want to add to that is that, you know, I think machines are just making us incredibly productive, right? I mean, the, the kinds of things we can get done in a day now are, you know, things that would take a month earlier. So they are making us incredibly productive, but the problems are still hard uh, and they're not going to get any easier. I mean, prediction is a difficult problem, especially about, you know, when it's about the future, as Yogi Berra said. Um, and you sort of have to have sort of a Pepe Le Pew approach to life in this business because, <laughs> you know, almost everything just fails, right? And you just have to sort of get, you know, pick yourself up and say, all right, you know, that was a terrible idea. Uh, let me just think about it again, right? So, you know, that's what I would suggest is just sort of having this approach where, you know, you know, most of the time stuff just isn't going to work. It's very different from other domains. The frustration is really high, but by the same token, you know, as I often tell people, you know, if you've got a system that wins 54% of the time with equal winners and losers, you should be managing your, the, the world's money, right? So while there's weak signal, the barrier is not quite the same as it is, as it is with driverless cars, where a single fatality can put you out of business, right? Here, you're doing well 53, 54% of the time, you're doing great. Yeah, I, I, yeah. The, 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 very quickly, the two things I wanted to say is I've never heard Yogi Berra and Pepe Le Pew in the same two sentences <laughs> consecutively, which is amazing. The other thing is that um, I think the premium will, is on most of us to be adaptive. You know, that's the only defense we have to evolve over time ourselves, try lots of things and uh, keep developing and developing ourselves. And that's, that's it. What a fantastic conversation here from two practitioners and theorists as well. Uh, but first and foremost, practitioners in this space, uh, great conversation for Real Vision uh, Festival of Learning AI edition. Really magnificent, guys. I hope you'll come back and join us again soon. For sure, Ash. Thanks Always so much for this. Pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Hassan, Harry, thanks both of you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for watching, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.